Well, hey everybody, it is Pastor Mitchell here. Thanks so much for joining us, whether you are watching online or in person, we're glad you're a part of what we're doing together as a church family. I'm bringing you the announcements today from our living room. We're so excited for Christmas. We've got our tree up, we're all decorated. Uh, we are ready to go, although there's still a whole lot more left to do. But some of that Christmas cooking is done and we're just excited for this season. Now today, if you got little ones in the room, I wanna encourage you, those up to age the nursery is now open downstairs and for those up to age 10 you can head on down for lighthouse cove continued and you can head down there now as well if you've come prepared to give today just want to remind you of the offering box on the back table on the way out you can drop your envelope or if you want to give online through e-transfer you can certainly do that by sending that to apbchurch75 at gmail.com and thanks so much for giving toward the mission and ministry that we share in together and as well uh, as always Always the registration for next Sunday morning, 9.15 and 11 o'clock services here at APBC. You can follow the link to register online for that right now, or you can call or text Barbara and let her know that you are planning to attend. So a few things heading into this Advent season as it is under way if you have been tracking with us in terms of reading through the gospel of luke we are into day six today uh, a chapter a day right up till christmas eve you'll get through the whole gospel of luke and know why we make such a big deal out of christmas uh, if you've been following along with us on that i know i've really enjoyed reading through that each day um, if you haven't started but want to two chapters a day will get you caught up by the end of the week and i'd really encourage you to track along uh, with that reading plan through the month of december at least until Christmas Eve and as well uh, if you follow us on Facebook or if you're not yet want to encourage you to do so you can like and follow our church page there we've been posting each day some new content through the Advent season maybe it's a Christmas song maybe it's an activity you can do with your family uh, all kinds of different things happening each day I want to encourage you to check that out uh, for some encouragement through the Advent season as we lead into Christmas as well now a few things happening this week in the life of our church I want to make sure that you are aware of. First of all, there was supposed to be this evening a Panal Christmas held at Hebron Baptist Church. That event has been canceled, and so there is not going to be a Panal Christmas happening tonight at Hebron Baptist Church in case you were planning to attend. Well, we had also planned to cancel our Sunday evening service in light of that event, um, and because we just received word this week, we are still going to continue to have our evening service canceled, so there is no evening service tonight here at APBC either. As well, this week going on on Friday, don't forget, is our seniors lunch here at the church. I want to encourage you if you are a senior to attend that. Uh, we'd love to have you along. If you consider yourself senior or almost senior, uh, we would love to have you along. If you are planning to come, if you can let Florence know as soon as possible so we can plan on numbers for that. Uh, it's going to be Friday at 1130. And uh, again, just want to encourage you to come on out as we share in a meal together. There's going to be chowder and I think some turkey soup maybe, and a bunch of other things happen. So 11.30 Friday for all of you seniors, let Florence know as soon as you can that you are going to be here. As well, our friends over at New Heights Baptist Church on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday evening uh, from six until 7.30 are hosting a live nativity drive through and if you want to uh, take some time in one of those evenings again friday saturday or sunday uh, from 6 to 7 30 new heights baptist church in arcadia live nativity drive through you don't want to miss that event and if you want to bring along a donation toward i think it's the food bank or camp Pinal, uh, you can certainly do that as well as they'll be receiving donations for those things and just as a heads up for next sunday two things i want to remind you of first of all don't forget gifts from the keel and juno per house are going to be due next Sunday. That's the absolute latest we can receive those. As well, uh, if you are planning to give toward one of the CBM projects, uh, we just want to remind you, you've got two Sundays left uh, before those gifts are due as well. And for more information on any of those gifts and what you might want to bring or give to any of those projects, you can grab the generosity page off the back table that has a lot more information about that as well. Now, 
I know many of you are wondering what's going to happen for Christmas Eve. Uh, today we just want to tease out uh, that we are hoping to, we're tentatively planning on two Christmas Eve services, one at 4.30 and one at 6 o'clock here at the church. Uh, what will need to be a pre-registration event and we'll have more information on how you can do that next Sunday with all the details. We've still got a few things left to put into place for that, uh, but you can mark your calendar tentatively planning 4.30 and 6 o'clock for Christmas Eve here at the church. And as well, uh, we'll be hosting our Christmas Day service as well at 10 o'clock in the morning on Christmas Day. Now, with all of that behind us, uh, I hope that today's message both encourages and inspires you in taking your next step in trusting in and following Jesus. You know, it might be hard to imagine, um, but there was a time in perhaps for the longest part of human history, uh, there was no Christmas. <laughs> there were no Christmas decorations to be put up, no trees to be put up, no lights strung. Um, there were no shepherds on the hillside, no angels singing glory to God. Um, there was no manger scene. Uh, those things just didn't exist because Christmas was wait and see. That's what the message was. It was wait and see, wait and see. It was never a, it's finally here, it's wait and see. And in fact, as you look back through history, as you read through the Old Testament, as we introduced last week, as we kind of began uh, this series, His Name Is, uh, we took a look at Isaiah and what happened during the life and times of Isaiah in the 700s BC. And, and looking back, we, we saw that in 735 BC, it was King Ahaz who became king over the southern kingdom of Israel called Judah at the time. And so Ahaz becomes king, but he becomes king in the midst of a time of great political turmoil, turmoil because the northern kingdom of Israel had made an alliance with the uh, country above them, Syria. Um, the, there was an alliance formed to protect, in some ways, against the threat of a Syrian invasion toward the eastern part of the Mediterranean. And as Ahaz came to be king in the southern kingdom, uh, that is Judah, um, there was this military threat between them and the alliance above them between Israel and Syria that they were going to come in, they were going to take over Jerusalem, uh, they were going to depose the king, they were going to set up a puppet king so that they could strengthen their alliance to defend against any Assyrian conquest. And so all of this was happening when Ahaz became king. And in the midst of that, Isaiah the prophet came to Ahaz and said, Ahaz, listen, God is going to be with you and I know that you're afraid and the people are afraid, but know that God will be with you. He himself has promised that what you're fearing will actually not come to come to happen. It won't come to pass. And so they are not going to come in and destroy Jerusalem. And he says, to demonstrate this to you, God has invited you to ask him for any sign. Well, Ahaz refuses a sign. And then Isaiah says, well, if you're not going to ask, God's just going to give you a sign. And the sign is going to be that a young woman will bear a child. And before that child is old enough to know the difference to be able to choose from right and wrong, the nations of which you are fearful of will be laid desolate and to waste. And, and that's what happened. It was only a few years later that um, the Assyrians came and invaded and Syria and the northern kingdom of Israel were, were laid waste and Jerusalem was never you know, taken over, destroyed. And in the process of all of that, God had promised that he would be with those people. God gave them a sign, and Judah was not destroyed. Now, you continue to read through Isaiah from chapter 7 on. By the time you get to chapter 9, uh, we see these words of the prophet in verse 1. But there will be no gloom for her who is in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali. And as we said last week, those are the two tribes that would have been invaded first in northern Israel as the Assyrians began their conquest. Those places were laid waste. But, Isaiah says, but in a latter time, in another day, he says this, he has made glorious, that is, God has made glorious, the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. In other words, God, through what happens in Galilee and through the nation of Israel and eventually to the whole world, there is going to be hope for 
people, that, that the land and the people that were in darkness will see a great light. And he goes on to say this by the time we get to verse 6, for to us a child is born. Now this is another child at another time and in the future, someday in a day off from and removed from Isaiah and from Ahaz and from the current circumstances, that there is going to be a light, there's going to be a hope, and it's going to be in the region of Galilee that this is all going to begin. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. Someone who's going to be in the line of David who will be unlike any other child. His kingdom is going to have no end. So we have all these you know, overtones of the line of David. There's a promised Messiah. There's a hope that's going to come. And he goes on to describe this child in this way. For to us a child is born, a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder. The burden of ruling and of leading will be placed on him. And his name shall be called Right? Remember last week we talked about when you name someone in these days, it wasn't just, oh, we like this name, so we'll pick this name, right? Um, it had significance, it had meaning, it actually had to do with the character of the one being named, and so his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This is an expression of the good character of the good king, of the promise, Messiah, of the child that would be born one day down the road. Well, the people of God wondered, as you and I would probably wonder. Peace, it seems so elusive, doesn't it? I mean, if you're a parent and you have young kids, like that five minutes of peace <laughs> that, that is just quiet is like, they're golden, right? And, and it, it happens for, for, maybe it's not even five minutes, I don't know, but it happens for a moment and you're like, ah, peace. And then all of a sudden, chaos erupts again, right? Um, and that's, that's how things go in our house, I know that. Um, or perhaps for you, it's like this Christmas season, can't I just sit with my cup of eggnog or coffee or eggnog latte or whatever it is in front of the fireplace by the tree and read a good book? That to me would be great peace. That would give me big, great peace, and I would feel at peace, like all's right with the world. And you know, you treasure those moments, you love those moments about the Christmas season, absolutely, but, but then it's elusive. It escapes somehow. And, and we wonder, you know, can there be peace to this conflict or that conflict, whether it's relationally, whether it's conflicts in the world? And we, we, Peace just kind of becomes this elusive thing that maybe it happens for a bit, but then it just kind of all gets blown up again. And I don't know if you've ever experienced those things. I mean, certainly we see them in the news, but even in your own life and in your own heart, it's like for a moment there's peace and then it's gone again. Is peace even a possible thing? Could it even be that someone could bring peace in a way that lasts forever becomes the question. And so the people of God, they waited and they longed for it and they watched for century after century after century for this to happen and the Babylonians in 586 eventually uh, overran Judah and all the nation of Israel now was under foreign occupation and then the Persians uh, defeated the Babylonians in 538 Israel became a vassal state of the Persian Empire and then in 332 BC Alexander the Great who's you know, you know Hellenizing the world and spreading Greek culture all across the known world, he has now occupied the land. And by the time we get to 63 BC, something significant happens. The Roman general Pompey captured the city of Jerusalem and began a new era of occupation of the people of God in their land. And so the question was, century after century, we're watching, we're waiting, will it happen? When is the Prince of Peace going to arrive? Now here's the thing that's interesting about the year 63 BC. Not only is it interesting that Pompey captures Jerusalem and that, uh, you know, that that world event happens politically and geographically, but in that same year, 63 BC, uh, Baby was born in September of that year whose name was Gaius Octavius. Now, you might not recognize that name right away, but listen to the story. When Gaius Octavius was 19 years old, now in 44 BC, Julius Caesar 
was assassinated. And if you remember this from your history class, and maybe you don't, but I'll catch you up, uh, Julius Caesar was assassinated, and as a result, a triumvirate was formed between Gaius Octavius, Mark Antony, and Lepidus. And the three of them sought to defeat the assassins who murdered Julius Caesar. And eventually they were successful. And after they defeated those assassins, they divided up the Republic into three sections. And Gaius Octavius and Mark Antony and Lepidus became rulers of a divided Republic as they ruled as dictators in the known world. And Octavius eventually seized full control, taking it from Lepidus and Mark Antony Antony and became the first emperor of Rome in 27 BC. And he ruled from 27 BC to 14 AD. Now, why do I tell you all this? Well, if you haven't figured it out yet, Gaius Octavius, who that becomes his story, when he becomes emperor, you know him as Caesar Augustus. Now, why do you know the name Caesar Augustus? Maybe because you remember your Roman history from school, right? Maybe because you brushed up on that before. But, but you know Caesar Augustus, my hunch is, mostly because he is a footnote in the birth story of Jesus, who's called the Christ. Now, Caesar Augustus was harsh, as a ruler, he was unrelenting. He was a master administrator, however. And the thing about Caesar Augustus is this, that he restored order throughout the Roman Empire after two decades of civil war. He ushered in a period of history uh, that's referred to as Pax Romana, which is 250 years-ish of, of generally peace throughout the Roman Empire. And he was heralded as the great Caesar Augustus. In fact, it goes even greater than that. There has been found, according to archaeological findings, um, something called the Priene Calendar Inscription. I don't know if you've ever heard of that before. It's been found in Turkey. It's this inscription on a tablet that's a decree um, that, that, that calls for uh, the restarting of the calendar after Caesar Augustus's birthday. Now, this happened often in the ancient world. If somebody of notable character, you restarted the calendar based on their birthday. And so, so there's this prying calendar inscription that's found in Turkey um, that speaks of Caesar Augustus and his reforms and his ability and his leadership and as emperor, what he's accomplished. And there's this calling for uh, a redating of the calendar. And here's what is part of the prying calendar description. It says the gospel, the word gospel is used, the gospel or the good news of the God Augustus, the savior to his people who will bring an end to war, which is another way of saying who has brought peace throughout the empire. Now this calendar inscription is dated back to 9 BC, but for the Jews, it didn't seem like, and, and rightly so, it didn't seem like, like this is just no king from the line of David. I mean, that part's obvious, right? Like this, the Caesar Augustus is no king from the line of David. This is not the promised deliverer, the prince of peace that, that Isaiah spoke of. And not only that, but, but, but Roman occupation didn't really feel like peace either. But here's the thing, it's into that world, it's into that context, it's into that geopolitical you know, environment and climate that Jesus Christ is born. And Luke, who interviewed the eyewitnesses, right, talked to those who were involved in the life story of Jesus, who saw what Jesus did, who heard what Jesus said, Luke talking to the eyewitnesses, who followed all of these events closely, right? Luke, who, who, who writing to Theophilus says, I've, I've, I've been following this story myself, and I wanted to put together for you, Theophilus, an orderly account. Why? So that you can have certainty about the things that you've been told about Jesus, right? So you can know the story about him and what's true about him. Luke tells us the story and he goes all the way back to the birth of the Messiah and even before that. But we're going to jump into chapter 1 of Luke, verse 26. And, and it reads this way. It says, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. Now, if you're familiar with any of the prophecy of Isaiah, 
These verses should call to mind all kinds of things already, right? So it's in the sixth month. Well, the sixth month of what? Well, Elizabeth, who is Mary's relative, whose husband was Zechariah, who was a priest in the temple, who was on in age, the scripture says, uh, she who was thought to be barren is now you know, has a child that she is going to bear. And it's in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy that the angel Gabriel was sent from God to Galilee, right? Galilee, God's going to honor the way and the night, right? Through Galilee, like the people walking in darkness will see a great light. There's going to be hope. So an angel sent to Galilee to a town or a city called Nazareth to a young woman, a virgin, betrothed to a man whose name is Joseph of the house and, you know, of the line of David, like this has kingly overtones. This has political overtones. This comes from David's family tree. Like there is connection upon connection upon connection to things past that were spoken of that would take place. And so now this angel comes to visit Mary. And here's how the account unfolds. Starting at verse 28, it says, And he came and said to her, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled and tried to discern what kind of greeting this might be. Now, now again, you read through the scriptures. When anybody sees an angel, right, or when an angel appears uh, in any of the biblical stories, the response of the person who sees the angel is often terror, Right? Like, I am afraid. Like, this is not, oh, look at the lovely, you know, padded baby with his harp on the cloud. It's so cute. Just want to grab his chubby cheeks, right? Like, that is not the picture of the angel. And so, so the angel appears, and Mary is freaking out inside. Like, this is, this is a scary thing. Like, is this going to be good news, or is this going to be bad news? I sure hope it's not bad news. It might be bad news, but I hope it's good news. But maybe it's not going to be good news. It could be bad news. And she's just, she's just not sure. And so the angel, recognizing this, says to her in verse 30, do do not be afraid, Mary. In other words, this is a good news visit, okay? Don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Now, the story goes on, but I just want to pause for a second. What's happening is this, that what God spoke of before, that people waited century after century after century to see, what, what was wait and see? Is it possible now that it was becoming here and now? Was the wait and see actually here and now in this moment in this time, is it all beginning to unfold? Because this child, right, in Galilee, born of a virgin, in the line of David, what Isaiah spoke of is now becoming historical reality. What was once promised, is it possible that it's actually coming true? Well, Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I am a virgin, which is a natural question to ask to this kind of announcement. And the angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the most high will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called holy, the son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And then the angel departed from her. He's going to be called son of the most high. In fact, son of God, but not in the same way that people would think about Caesar Augustus as emperor of the world who's brought peace, the savior of the world. This child was not going to be son of God in the same way that people would think of Caesar. And so what happens? Well, Mary visits Elizabeth upon hearing the good news about Elizabeth. So she goes to visit and she spends some time with her. We think probably until the end of Elizabeth's pregnancy. And so, so, so during that time, she sings praises to God about what God has done, the great things he has done for her, the great things God will do for his people. And she then has to do the hard moment of talking to Joseph about the whole circumstance. And a few months pass. And meanwhile, the news that Caesar has ordered a census to be taken finally reaches Nazareth. So this was probably set in motion. This announcement of a census being taken is probably set in motion a few years out, right? And so what, again, historically in the world began all 
all in the right time, now leads to this moment where Mary and Joseph now have to travel to Bethlehem to be registered. And Luke tells us the story that they make their way there. And when they finally arrive in Bethlehem, she gave birth to a son, named him Jesus, wrapped him in swaddling cloths, right? Tighten up the limbs, you know, so the baby's not flailing around. We're going to swaddle him up, keep him nice and comfy and warm. And she laid him in a manger. Why? Because there was no room for them in the inn. There's no place for them to stay when they got to Bethlehem. And so, so in this moment, like whether it's the same night or just a few days out from Jesus being born, here's what Luke tells us happened. Again, Luke chapter 2, verse 8. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flocks by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled, again, with great fear. They're afraid. Like, what kind of news is this? What kind, what's going on? Like, is this a good news thing? Is it a bad news thing? And the angel said to them, don't be afraid. Why? Because I am bringing you gospel. I'm bringing you good news of great joy that will be for all the people, not just for the Jews. This is not a Jewish thing. This is not a God's you know, nation thing. This is the all people like Gentiles too, like peoples of the world, like all the kinds of peoples that there are. The good news is not just for the Jews. It is for the whole world. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased this savior of the world that is announced as it turns out would not be a new Caesar would not be a new emperor would not be someone who would simply save a nation or the known world from a long history of civil war as much peace as that might have brought to the peoples of the known world of the time it would not be a lasting peace for sure and it certainly didn't mean peace for everybody but the announcement of the angels on this night is glory to not caesar augustus but glory Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. And that peace is a sense of wholeness and of completeness and of harmony and is always attached to the favor of God. And this announcement of gospel and of good news is not an announcement of a new Caesar. It is an announcement of one who is a child whom, on, upon whom the government will be placed on his shoulders, and his name is Prince of Peace. Why? Why is that the title? Why is that the name given to the child? Why is that the name as part of the whole longer description, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace? How is peace, why is peace a designation given to this child, the prince of peace? And the reality is, is that as you continue to read through Luke, we see the reason for that title be, you know, brought, to, brought to fruition. It's, it's unfolded before us, and that's why we said in their kind of daily reading through Luke through the month of December and the Advent, like Luke does not end his story with the birth of the baby and say, look, hey, Isaiah's prophecy came true. The child was born, right? The son was given. They called him Jesus. Let's tie a bow on it and celebrate Christmas. Like, that is not how the story goes. In fact, there are how many more chapters of Luke to make your way through that tell the whole story of the child who was born. And what we see as we make our way through and understand the good news is this, that God became flesh, that Jesus is the son of the most high God, the savior of the world. He is the prince of peace. Why? Because he makes our peace with God. It's through him that peace with God is possible. 
It's through him that we find peace in our relationship with God. That through his life, death, resurrection, that is the good news. A savior who is born, right? And he is going to do something that will save the world. And as you read through Luke and you read through the gospels, what you see is that his way of saving the world was suffering as a servant and laying down his life for the sake of people like you and me. That though we were far from God and hostile toward God and enemies of God, that we could be made right with God. Where there was division in our relationship with God, where there was hostility and enmity, right? When we hated God, when we dishonored and disobeyed him, what did he do? He sent his own son into the world that through his death and resurrection that we might find our peace with God. Man, don't we all need that peace? Now, now what of the kingdom? What of the line of David? What of the promise of the Messiah? Like, isn't there, isn't there a piece of that attached? Like, like what about all those things? Because if we're honest, doesn't it feel like sometimes there's just not peace? Like, if he's come to bring peace, why don't we still experience peace? Well, part of that is because the, the peace that he came to bring was the peace of our relationship with God. That, again, through his life, death, and resurrection, we'd be reconciled to God and have that relationship restored. And through that relationship, there's the possibility of relationship among others as well. But what of the kingdom? What of the from everlasting to everlasting? What of his reign and rule shall never end and the government on his shoulders and, and all of those things? What of the kingdom of God? And what we see, again, is this tension of the already but the not yet. The peace of Christ has come to rule in our hearts. Absolutely, we have that peace with the Lord. But the day is coming when the fullness of the kingdom of God is going to break through and be established on earth. That's that's how the story unfolds, and we're just not there yet. Right? And so, so the reason we feel that tension of you know, peace on earth, what is that? Why is peace so elusive? Like, like why hasn't that happened? Is because it just hasn't happened yet. There's the peace that comes through knowing the Lord and the peace that comes in our relationship with him, but the day is coming in the future still when his fullness, the fullness of his kingdom will come. And here's, and I would submit to you this, there, this is the reason why people no longer bow the knee to Caesar Augustus, right? Like, that kingdom came to an end. That's why the, people don't honor Caesar Augustus anymore, right? But people still bow the knee to Jesus. Why? Because they know the peace that comes through relationship with him and his reign and rule still continues today from everlasting to everlasting in the hearts of human beings that, that no other leader, you know, that's never happened for any other leader in the history of the world. Now we might say, well listen, it sounds good and it sounds nice and peace with God is what we need, absolutely. And that's made possible in Christ Jesus, but, but sometimes it feels like our following Jesus isn't peaceful, right? Like, it seems like it doesn't bring peace. In fact, sometimes it feels like it brings division, right? Now, now, now look, we all know, I'm sure all of us would have a story about how our, the peace we know and experience in our relationship with God, how that has transformed the relationship that we have with someone else. There's reconciliation with people in our lives that probably would never have been made possible without our common faith in Christ, right? There is reconciliation that happens among the people of God where it just doesn't make sense anywhere else. And it's all because of what Christ has done. And there is peace made between people on the foundation of the nature of our relationship with God where hostilities are ceased, where divisions are done away with, right? Like all of those things disappear under the lordship of Jesus Christ. But, but sometimes our following Jesus, it feels like it just brings not peace, but Something else, conflict, division, disunity, you know, put us at odds with our friends, with our coworkers, with our spouse, with our family, right? Christmas dinner, you know, you show up, oh, there they go talking about Jesus again and why Christmas is all, keep Christ in Christmas, you know, like, and, and it just, like, there's, there just seems to be, whether it's just small little jabs or just people who aren't going to have anything to do with because of faith, like, that doesn't seem like peace. What's up with that? 
It shouldn't come as any surprise to us, honestly. If we read through the whole gospel, we see in Luke chapter 12, uh, starting at verse 49, it says, Jesus himself says this, I came to cast fire on the earth and would that it were already kindled. That doesn't sound very peaceful, does it? You show up at work someday with a fireball machine. You just start, you know, like, if there was such a thing existed, right? Like, like throwing fire at somebody doesn't sound like a peaceful thing. But Jesus says, I've come to cast fire on the earth and would that it already be kindled. But then he goes on to say this, I have. So, so in other words, there's going to be a judgment. There's judgment coming. Like, don't think we escape the judgment and the wrath of God. But he says, I have a baptism to be baptized with. And how great is my distress until it is accomplished. I mean, Jesus himself admits to this. Man, I am feeling the distress over something that's going to happen to me, of something I'm going to be immersed in, something I'm going to have to walk through, right? There's something, there's a baptism going to happen to me, and it is stressing me out. It's, it's causing me pain, There's the pain of expectation. There's the wave of sorrow that that when I think about what's going to take place, it causes me great distress. He says, do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? To which we want him to say, yes, you have. But he says, no, I tell you. But rather, division. Well, how does that jive with the message of the angels? (laughs) Like, Jesus, did, you, did, did, did God change his mind from when you were born to when you're saying these things? Or are you getting it wrong? Like, like what's that all about? I, I thought it was peace on earth and goodwill to all people on whom God's favor rests and, you know, all the rest. But now you're talking about fireballs and, you know, distress and sorrow and division. What's that all about? Well, he goes on to say this. He says in verse 52, For from now on in one house there will be five divided three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. And we could add father-in-law with sons-in-laws and we could, you get the picture, right? Like, Like there are issues, there's conflict, there's division even among families and even within the same household. Why? Because what Christ Jesus has come to accomplish will force people to make a decision about him and where their allegiance lies. And man, like, like when there's divided allegiances, that, that's where division happens. That's where conflict takes place. That's where, that's where things go off the rails. That's, that's where, so, so, so what does Jesus say? He's saying, look, yeah, listen, I, I've come to this earth for a specific purpose and I'm gonna walk through something that's causing me great distress. You don't even know the half of it, he says, right? And, and, and until it is finished, that distress exists. And if you think I've just come to, tell everybody, you know, get along and and that's just going to magically happen somehow, then you've you've missed it, right? What, what, the thing I am about to do is actually going to result in division between peoples because, again, their allegiances and loyalties are going to be divided over who I am and what I have come to do. And I have come to make peace with God absolutely, but those who won't believe it are going to be divided over who I am. And so there's this unsettling moment that happens during the Last Supper. Jesus knows that he's about to be betrayed by Judas and led away to be crucified. And, and, and Jesus hints at this, and Peter says, Look, Lord, I'm with you to the end. I'm there. I got my sword. I'm packing, right? Like, we're, we're going to, there's nobody, and I'll go to the death with you. And Jesus says, Really, Peter? Listen, before the rooster crows, three times in the morning. Before the rooster crows in the morning, you're going to deny that you even know me three different times. Well, Peter just is devastated over that. How could you say that, Jesus? Do do you not have any faith in me? Like, and, and, but then Jesus says this, he says, but don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't, Don't let that cause you panic, right? You believe God, believe also in me. In my father's house, there are many rooms, right? And I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. Haven't I told you that I'm going to go and prepare a place for you? And if I go and I prepare a place for you, I'm going to come back so that I can take you to be with me so that you can be where I am 
forever kind of thing, right? So, but I can't take you to be with me until I go away first and prepare the place and then come back to get you so that then I can take you to be with me. And so there's this exchange that goes on and then the question becomes, well, how do we even know where you're going? We don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And, and Jesus just is trying to reassure his disciples that, that things are going to unfold and things are going to happen, that, that he's going to go away for a while and they're going to feel like they're left alone and they're not sure what's going to happen to them and what do we do in the meantime in the waiting between when you actually go away and when you return what happens and what does that look like and and how do we deal with that and so he goes on in verse 27 of that same chapter of john 14 says peace i leave with you when I go away, I'm leaving you my peace. By the way, I give my peace, I give to you. So, so Jesus talks about peace as if it's some kind of possession that they can have. My peace I give you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. And, and that's less about like, you know, we, don't, we want to be careful. We don't kind of read this as like, oh, the world gives and then it takes it back and gives and takes it back. Like it's, it's less to do with the way in which the world gives, but what the world gives, right? Because when someone dies, what, what's the legacy that's often left to people? What's the thing that's left? It's their possessions, right? Their stuff, their money, their estate, you know, stuff that fades away, right? And, and, but what does Jesus say? He says, not as the world gives, right? I, I've, I'm going to give you something that's better than that. It, it lasts longer than that. I'm giving you my peace. Don't let your heart, he says again, be troubled. Don't be afraid. Why? Don't, let them, don't be discouraged over all this because in this world, there will be troubling things. Like that's the reason he has to say, don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't let them be afraid because in this world there is trouble and distress and affliction and those things are not immediately removed just because we trust and follow Jesus. That's not how it works. It's not what he came, it's not what he promised. It's not what he came to do, right? And it's not that his promise is empty or meaningless. It's, it's that he's saying, look, the reality of the situation is I've come to bring peace between you and God, and that's going to happen through what happens to me, the baptism I'm baptized with, in the next day. But, lo- but know this, and listen, don't be troubled because I'm leaving you my peace. He actually goes on to say, don't be troubled, don't be afraid, but take heart. Why? Because I have overcome the world. I've said these things to you, right? That in me, in me, Jesus says, it's in me, not in something else, not in your hope here or the possession here or the other. It's in me you may have peace because in this world you will have tribulation, but take heart because I have overcome, I have conquered, I am victorious over the world. And you and I can have peace in knowing Christ Jesus. Why? Because one, he gives us his peace even though we experience trouble and affliction and heartache and distress and things go wrong and things go off, even though in our lives, even right now, things are not all at peace and in harmony and whole and complete like, like we hope or expect or want them to be. But he says, I said these things because in me you have peace. And that's why I say that in Christ there are, recon- there are what would have been irreconcilable differences can come to be reconciled because in him there is peace and wholeness. And so even though there is tribulation, he has overcome the world. And no matter what happens to us, our future is secure. No matter what happens, no matter what, ha- and I say that recognizing the full gamut of anything that could happen to us, that no matter what happens, Jesus says, I have overcome the world. And so, so take heart, right? So, so during the Advent season, what do we do? We look back to the nativity. We look back to the expectation that the people of God waited and waited for century after century after century warning to see the Messiah arrive. And he has. And we look forward now, right? He's made our peace with God. And we look forward to the day of his present and final reign and rule. And we live in the tension of the already but the not yet. 
because we have peace with God in Christ Jesus, his reign and rule in our hearts, and we await still the day when his kingdom is established in its fullness. And listen, kingdoms will rise and kingdoms will fall, and leaders will rise and leaders will fall, and leaders will rise and leaders will die, and nation after nation will be in conflict, and there might seem to be peace for a while. Like all of that continues to happen in the world, but whose reign and rule still endures through all of those things? The reign and rule of Jesus the Messiah. And one day, his kingdom will fully be established. And right now, we can know peace because we know Jesus. He leaves us. He gives us his peace. And that gives us the courage to keep going until the day when his reign and rule is finally established on earth. He is the Prince of Peace. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you that he is the Prince of Peace. And no matter what tensions or troubles or conflicts that we experience in the here and now, I am so thankful that we can know peace, that, that Jesus, you gave us your peace. You've left it with us, though, that in the midst of the conflict and the trouble and the pain and the long suffering, that we have that glimpse of wholeness, that there will be, and, and even now, that our relationship with you has been restored because of what you have done. And so I pray that through this Advent season, as we think of you as the Prince of Peace, that we would know peace and know the peace that comes through knowing Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. We pray in his name. Amen.